Hello to our PsyQ community and welcome to today's webinar, Making Sense of Uncertainty, a discussion with New York City Metro Area Clinician and a peer specialist on the impact of COVID-19 on psychiatry from the U.S. Epicenter. I'm Dr. Jahan Marino from the Otsuka Medical Affairs team, and today I will serve as the moderator for a discussion with our panel of speakers that we're happy to have today, Dr. Joseph Goldberg, Dr. Brendan Montano, and Mr. Dwayne Mays. So let's talk about COVID status in our country and focus really in on the New York City metro area. Next slide, please. As we know, New York State, as well as New Jersey and Connecticut, the tri-state area, have been highly impacted in terms of the numbers of positive cases of COVID-19 compared with other states across the U.S. As you can see here on the right, the red colors indicate higher positive cases. In New York State alone, it has over 130,000 positive cases, with the highest reported numbers being in the New York City area, with over 72,000 positive cases. On the left-hand side, this depicts New York City, the metro area. Over 50% are reports of positive cases that are indicated in those red and orange colors. And you can see that's in several areas of New York City. So knowing that, a couple of you actually live in the area of the initial outbreak that started here in New York. I wanted to ask our first question, Dr. Goldberg first. What was your initial observation of how the COVID-19 and containment orders were affecting your patient's mental health? And has this changed over the past couple of weeks or not, given the current events? Dr. Goldberg. Uh, so I think part of what's so striking about this is it moves so fast and it changes day to day and week to week, so it becomes hard to track. I've had patients who've lived through 9-11, I've had patients who've lived through World War II who are telling me this is different because it's an ever-changing phenomenon and affects so many different areas of life. It's not like one event, a discrete disaster like a hurricane happened, and then you recover from it. Every day there's something new and a real sense of disruption. So I think one of the biggest phenomena I've, I've observed, not just in patients, but everybody I can think of is the disruptions of predictability over life and routine. It's, it's hard to formulate a response to a stress if the stress keeps changing and you don't know what it is. So part, part of the challenge, I think, is imparting to patients a sense of there is an uncertainty and that that's the constant and that's a given. So all we can do is really stay in the moment, day by day, step by step, and try to stay informed and try to do self-care and be mindful and not succumb to what I would call the, the, the chaos anxiety as opposed to the productive anxiety that comes from dealing with an unknown. Um, that means being a, sort of a, a droning voice of, are you taking care of yourself? Are you following a routine? Are you minimizing disruptions as best you can? Are you staying connected socially because there's something about the fabric of being socially connected? To people even in times of physical distancing and isolation that can be very grounding orienting to people um, does taking care of yourself mean um, not just physical needs and sleep and appetite and exercise but taking your medications or has this been an occasion to take a break from your treatment um, has this been a rationalization to pick up drinking uh, or, or go back to some long fought battle of one's personal experience with some uh, conflict in, in their own lives and, and, and kind of taking a devil may care attitude. So I think the big challenge has been helping people just sort of stay grounded and, and be in the moment and, and practice self-care. I can't say that I, in my experience, have seen a lot of um, specific, COVID-specific elements of, of, of mental health crisis come up. I, I was half expecting patients falling with a kind of a, a chicken little sky is falling disaster. Uh, I haven't seen that as much. It's been more, you know, I can't go, I can't work. I'm home with my kids. I got to do homeschooling. Uh, I got to keep the supply chains open. I don't know what's going to happen. The same as everybody else. Um, so that, that that's that's what my overall sense of how the patients react. And Dr. Montano, your thoughts. You know, I appreciate everything that Dr. Goldberg has said, and I agree with him. The one thing that I'm noticing is that some of my patients, they don't call, they're doing very well, it appears, but then many of them 
are feeling very anxious. And um, if they have difficulty self-regulating their anxiety, in other words, their habits may not be as healthy in many ways. The basics that we teach in primary care, you know, are often good nutrition, good physical activity levels, and, you know, uh, using uh, techniques to reduce stress as best as possible. Some of them are challenged in that regard, and especially those with serious emotional uh, and mental illness. And I'm sure Dr. Goldberg has seen people with bipolar and schizophrenia who are having trouble, uh, especially with this self-isolation and, uh, you know, the the decrease in activity in their world. Uh, so with, with the threats that we have in this unknown uh, viral enemy that we don't see, but are, it's lurking. And, you know, people are really worried to a point where they're having trouble and they're catastrophizing even more than the actual disease often. And especially those who are, you know, in the 80, 85 percent who have uh, low to minimal symptomatology. And what are we doing this for? Of course, we're doing it primarily for that 15 percent that 5 to 10 to 15% who gets seriously ill. So, um, you know, with that involved and with all the, the, the changes in covering people losing their jobs and people losing their livelihoods with businesses closing, that's a huge stress. And uh, we need to have ways of working with them. Um, I'm trying to suggest, for instance, that they all get physical activity, albeit, uh, you know, within six feet and no more than another person, if possible. But have physical activity, that's huge, okay? Not to go crazy trying to run when you've been a, a, a couch potato, but maybe a nice brisk walk and getting out in the sunshine a bit. And along with that, of course, uh, also using some of the techniques that uh, we are seeing used for relaxation, yoga. Um, if, if you're in yoga, that's great. If you're not, how about progressive relaxation. There's some websites. Uh, one in particular uh, that I'm using now is the Dartmouth uh, student website, which looks at, you know, you know, deep breathing, progressive relaxation, and it takes you back to the here and now and away from catastrophizing about the future. So um, this is the kind of thing I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm trying to get back to my patients and give them assurance and reassurance and, you know, it's been really gratifying as a physician. I must say, I'm sure Dr. Goldberg will tell you, he's got that same relationship with his patients. You know, when they are appreciative of you, they give you feedback, and that is good for us, too. And just uh, fully agree. Um, tremendous points. But one thing I'd add, too, is, is the opportunity to proactively check in with one's own patients. Um, so uh, there are people that I have not heard from in a while that I'm checking in with. There are also people that I haven't heard from a while who are checking with me, almost reflexively asking for a refill on something or a dosage increase. I would take this opportunity to, um, to not simply write a renewal, especially if someone's been out of touch, but to check in. So one individual I can think of hadn't heard from in about a year, and, and one of the Benza, they asked me renewal, and I said, you know, this is a difficult time. We haven't talked in a while. Why don't we meet and, 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 and you know, do a telesession? So it turns out there was a whole lot going on with this fellow I hadn't known about. And he'd up his own benzo use and he was drinking more and he'd stop, he'd stop the uh, depression medicine because he thought it wasn't safe to mix with the alcohol. So the alcohol mm -hmm. won and the medicine lost. And, you know, we caught up on a year's worth of information and came up with a new plan. So um, we don't want to let anybody fall through the cracks. Excellent. Thank you. This is really good discussion. Let's move on with our next question, though. With all the media coverage around this pandemic, especially in this area, what do you think the role of healthcare professionals is in assisting patients in understanding the news coverage and how it might impact their symptoms? So let's start with Wayne. Thank you. Um, I do agree with what both doctors have mentioned so far in terms of how individuals have been responding to uh, this uh, pandemic. When it comes to the media coverage, one of the things that I've encouraged my, uh, my staff to do is limit their own exposure to the news media. It is important to stay informed, but yet not get overwhelmed with the information and the constant uh, reports of the number of fatalities or you know, illnesses that are being reported on a, a daily basis. And 
just limit their exposure to the negative side of what's being reported. Thanks, uh, Dr. Montano, any thoughts around this? Oh, I quite agree with Duane on that one. Uh, I think we've really got to, I've, I've asked some of my patients, how are you dealing with the stress? One of them said, I feel much better. I'm not watching the news anymore. That's pretty powerful. And so we need to, we need not to be overdosing on constant. Remember, news is about bad news more than it is good news. So there's a lot of emphasis on this, on, you know, creating the headline and, and getting viewership. And I think we need to ease off on that. So I highly agree with Dwayne. You need to reduce the input of the news and, again, get back to the basics at the same time. Thanks. I think we all need to think about these tips personally, too. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. So here is information from American Psychiatric Association. They conducted a national survey, and the results reported high levels of anxiety. I think that's what we would expect here. Uh, over half of the respondents reported feeling anxious, or possibly contracting COVID-19, and about 40% of them said they were really anxious about becoming seriously ill or even dying from the virus. And then at the bottom here, most of the survey respondents, over 50% of them, said they were concerned with the pandemic that it will have a serious impact on their finances. And two-thirds of them, almost 70%, fear it will impact the economy over the long, over the long-term duration. 